into the Word together. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word wa? was God. How many here realize that when you pray, if you pray the Word, thank you. Yep, she's lonely, want to sit by her? <laughs> I love you guys. Amen. So think about this. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing in all things through prayer and supplication or petitionings. Make your requests made known to God. Why does God need us to remake a request? Doesn't he know everything? Huh? You have not because, remember, God runs on invitation. He's not a pusher. He doesn't push himself into your life. He appeals to your life, but he's looking for you to love, start wanting him to invite him. Can you say amen? And so basically, we want to be able. So when you pray, you don't pray what you're going through because he knows. You remind God what he says in his word. Now listen, if you need healing, you say you find a couple of healing scriptures you read them to yourself until your mind is set on that, what it says. And then just hold the word up to him. You can read it to God. He loves that. He, he loves it. It's a petitioning. And you say, Father, you said in your word, by his stripes I'm healed. Therefore, by faith I believe I receive it. Now what happens? It's now in God's court. Now, here's where the devil comes in. He says, well, God might just say no. No. God never says no to his word. And can you tell me why? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So God cannot say no to himself. Hello. He can't. Linda, he can't put himself on hold. So what does the enemy do? He gets us to complain, think we're praying. And I'm not saying any of you are doing this. Okay? But what you do is if you're not feeling well, you get in Scripture, get a pocket promise book where all the promises are listed there so you don't have to go crazy trying to find them. Pull out on healing. If your finances are suffering, pull out on finances. If your friend is under attack, there's somebody here today with her friends under attack because people at home are picking on her. Or they're on this person. I don't know if it's a he or a she. So pray. When you're doing, find the scripture, look the scripture up to God and ask him to intervene and you won't have a problem with having your prayers answered. Someone say amen. All right, you ready to get into this? Happy Memorial Day, everybody. This is a time that we reflect and we remember those that have been in wars, those that labored. There are many, many people, even in the scripture, that have plowed, that have planted, that uprooted, that went into areas. They were sawn in half, they were persecuted, they were martyred. And you and I have a chance to realize that if it wasn't for maybe some of our relatives before us who didn't pray for us, who did pray for us, and who labored in love for us, this is what this day is about. On this day in the 1800s, the um, Army Corps decided that they were going to put flags on those at Arlington and those at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And the tradition was accepted and embraced. And from then on, it, we've been really uh, celebrating Memorial Day. But I think sometimes we forget. We're not supposed to dwell on our past, are we? We're not supposed to dwell on our mistakes, right? So Memorial Day is dwelling on the victories and those loved ones maybe in our lives and our families, those soldiers, those nurses, those wax and, and waves, I don't know the female ones that were in soldiers, the people like my mom who labored at Boeing making uh, B-29s, 
and all these kinds of things, the people that have gone before us laboring for us. Now the Bible said, Jesus said this, give honor to whom honor is due. So Memorial Day is really giving honor to those who deserve honor. Can you say amen? Who might you know in your family that you could remember? Remember I asked you to kind of pull out a couple of things in your memory that maybe there was somebody, maybe not a relative, that made an impression on your life whereby it changed you. And I did say, well, let's pass on a mic and we'll have you testify a little bit about it. Do you mind? All right, so let's see what God has to say. First of all, this is a day we stop, give honor to those who have fought the good fight of faith. Amen? And the effect thereof uh, has caused change in our nation, caused change in our families, and possibly change in our life. Can you say amen? All right? The time, it's time to reflect on those who served and gave their lives for our freedoms. We are the first, okay, today to want to acknowledge who first. Who should we acknowledge first as a memorial? God. Honor God, right? Amen. I want to read you a couple of scriptures on this line, and then we're going to be going, if you like to study, you go with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at some of the patriarchs. But meanwhile, I'm just going to set you up. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant in the earth. Hello? So we're to remember who? I want to tell you something about the Israelites. I love the Israelites, but the Israelites, they live in the Old Testament. They had to follow God. And somebody asked me the question a long time ago, why did God do so many miracles for the Israelites? And then in the New Testament, we don't see so many miracles. Why did God part Red Seas and fire and pillars of smoke and all that kind of back then? Do you know the answer? They needed to see signs and wonders. God had to lead them through signs and wonders. What happened? When they went through the wilderness, God led them by a cloud by day and a fire by night. Who was the cloud? God. Who was the fire? So here's what happened. During the day when it's real heat, God needed him to get across the desert when it's real hot. So he'd become a cloud to protect them and shield them. Outside the cloud, no one knew where they were. They were hidden. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And as the cloud moved, they moved with the cloud. And then at night, how many know it's good in the desert time to move at night? It's a lot cooler. At night, he warmed them, fire by night. And the fire caused them to be warm and they could see, not too bright, but see. And then it blinded the Egyptians because they couldn't tell where they were. Now, everything in the Old Testament, everything in the New Testament is a type and shadow. Who is the one that lives in our heart? God, right? And who's the one that we live in his heart? God. So, guess what? When we meet with God, when we walk with God, guess what? The devil doesn't see you. He sees God. During the day, God cools you and provides for you. During the night, he warms you. Why? He shields you. And that's why we honor God first on this Memorial Day. Can you say amen? Number two, the Israelites were given many things to practice. Many people didn't realize God gave them seven major feasts. Do you know why the feasts were there? Uh, to steal? Huh? To steal? No, not the thief. The, uh, the feasts, F-E-A-S-T. Oh. Okay? Celebrations. Why did God give seven celebrations to the Israelites? Because they were forgetful. They were 
like wedding rehearsals. One day the bride is going to come. The kids need to be about their father's business. Remember, they weren't born again. I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying weren't born again. So everything God did with the Israelites, and he might do this with you until you are strong in the Lord, is he will always remind you and give you things to practice as rehearsals about what's going to come. So when they celebrated the Passover, that was a type and shadow that Jesus would have a last Passover. He would cover us with the blood and Satan, the death angel, would have to pass us over. A memorial. Hello. How many here remember the word Gilgal? Okay. Do you know what Gilgal was? Let me tell you. I want to know. Okay. The Israelites, when they got right close to going into the promised land, they came up to the Jordan River. Everyone remember the Jordan? The word Jordan means where the Lord descends. Where did the dove descend when John was baptizing? Jordan! Yes. All right. So listen, as they came up to Jordan, God says, you put your foot in there, I'm going to part the sea. Right? Right? But he says, I want you to build a memorial of 12 stones. And it's called Gilgal, the place of the stones. That every time they would pass by, they would see a reminder of how God delivered them out of Egypt, out of bondage, and led them all across the wilderness. And now they have a reminder that God has given them his promise and promised land. Amen. Why did they need a reminder? I don't know. Why do we need one? We forget. Now remember, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve ate of that terrible fruit, it says the eyes of them were opened. What else was open? Satan's lies, Satan's suggestions. One other thing is forgetfulness. <laughs> Let's give you a dose of forgetfulness. One time, God said to the, oh, several times, but God says to the Israelites, and we're, we're taking it from Gilgal now into the promised land. I'm just telling you the stories. As they went into the promised land, he says, now when you go in there and you eat of the land that you did not plant, when you live in houses you did not build, anybody live in a house you didn't build? And when you eat food that somebody else provides, that you be careful, you forget not the Lord your God. When everything starts going good, when everything gets on the ease, we have a tendency to miss getting on our knees. And then we get to forgetting and taking, we don't mean to. I'm not picking on you. We don't mean to, and next thing you know, we get an alternative distraction that's nice and good. God gave to the Israelites every day of their life reminders not to forget the Lord thy God, because what did they do all the time? Forget. Forgot the Lord their God. Even when the Lord their God showed up, his name was Jesus. He came right on, they didn't even recognize him. That's why you and I, we've been given certain things to help remind us. We were given his word so that we could remember and search the word because there it is that speaks of him. We were given him, we were given his name. You have the name of Christ Jesus as your Follow your final last name. The Bible says in Revelations that when you're born again and get in heaven, he writes a new name. He gives you a white stone, which means key to the city. Can you say amen? He gave us a new name. He gave us the angels. He gave us not only the angels, but he gave us the armor. He gave us the blood. He gave us all of these things. The kingdom, all as a reminder don't be distracted because this world is passing away. Amen. I don't know how many hours and how many days I wasted partying and doing stupid stuff only to end up hugging a porcelain god. 
and go, oh, Lord, I'm never going to do that again. Now, I'm not talking about recently. I'm talking about my past. It's so lucky I'm alive. How many here are you are blessed to still be alive? Because you know some of the hard times you went through. Only you and God know maybe some of your relatives. Let's move right on. Are you with me? So God gave us reminders, but he gave the Israelites so many reminders. For example, the Israelites seek after a sign, but no sign shall be given other than the sign of Jonah, where the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of a well. Can you imagine how it was in Jonah's time? He decided he hated the Ninevites. How many here know anything about the Ninevites? They, look, they worship fish. Now, isn't God got a sense of humor? Who swallowed Jonah? You got to get to know your God. He got a great sense of humor. And here, Jonah says, I don't want anything to do with those fish worshipers. They were pagans, fish worshipers. And they often, their priests would wear hats that looked like fish heads. We have a denomination of sort of the people wear fish head hats. Kind of weird. <laughs> Ask them where they got it, they can't tell you. <laughs> people do the darndest things. Anyway, he didn't want to go, bless God, so he's on the ship. And you know what happened? God says, well, you're going to go. Storm comes up. And God puts it in the hearts of the sailors saying, hey, it's because that dude is disobeying God. Throw him overboard. Hello. Didn't it say that, that uh, a branch, when it, it, it breaks off, it withers, and men cast it into the flames of fire and trample under it? Nobody really understands that. You know why Jonah was so miserable? Because the only freedom and, and liberty he had was doing the will of God. He wasn't doing the will of God, and now these people were throwing him in the water. <laughs> people that know they need to be at church and serving God are most miserable doing anything else. Because once God slips from first place to second, so do you. Hello? We don't know these principles. We need to know these principles. Who's always first in your life? When your, your, your relatives show up and they say, well, we want you to visit with us. Why don't you not go to church this Sunday? You tell them, no, why don't you come to church with me and hear about the Savior? When are we going to make a stand instead of compromising? Somebody asked me the question, and the question was, hey, does God listen to all those prayers of unbelief? And God says, what prayers? I only listen to faith. Amen. Now let's move right along. Church is a filling station, not a dumping station. Amen. This is not camping at the end of the camp trip where you dump your trailer, you know. Never mind. Move right along. <laughs> are you with me? Three, today we are to stop, pay attention to those who are willing to sacrifice their lives, willing to pay the price. Can you say Amen. What did Jesus say? He said something as beautiful as this. No greater man, love than a man have than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, I'll stop right there for a minute. Jesus laid down his life for us, didn't he? And he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And everybody gets ca caught up in the word command. What did he tell his disciples to do when he was leaving? What did he ask the disciples to do? It was so important. Go to Jerusalem and be empowered from on high. Hello. Go get empowered. You see the power that's on my life? Jesus came as a man anointed by his father, yet he was God, but he left the God part up there so he could come down and taste everything like you and I, yet without sin. He should be memorialized because he broke Satan's neck for you. He smashed his head and put him under his feet. And by the way, the feet are in the body, not in the head. So look under your feet. See if his face is there. 
under the left one, under the right one. He's under defeat, your feet. And you say, well, how did he get there? You put him there by reminding him he's defeated already. You see, you don't have to fight as one beats the air. You don't have to rebuke him with the top of your voice. Ah, no, just get quiet. Start worshiping God and let God arise and God will just deck him. But we don't do that. We usually freak out. We start analyzing and start, well, what are we going to do? No. You go to the captain of your salvation. I did this once, and I said, God, what do I do? This is, it seems like, and he says, son, he says, did I just wake up? I says, no. He says, where have I been? Have I been somewhere out? I was in the restroom that I didn't hear what's going on. I says, no. He says, you need to relax and let me be in charge. Ouch. Ow. Because I wanted to help God. We want to help him so bad we actually get in the way. Amen. All right. So go with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 12. We have a great cloud of witnesses that are constantly looking down at us. Everyone say, oh, oh. A cloud of witnesses. Now, we're going to show you what some of the witnesses are, but let me ask you, can God look down and see you? Of course. Now, let me blow your mind. Can God look up and see him? Yeah, he is in you. Isn't that silly? You're filled with God. Say amen. amen. All right. So who else can the angels, do they watch you? Of course. Yeah. He's got all these angels, and guess what? They're watching us. They're witnessing, and the Bible says in Ephesians and Colossians that we teach the angels of God by what we do for the Lord. So let me just encourage you, be careful what you try to sneak around with. <laughs> just joking. All right. Besides that, did you know that all the saints have gone on before you? Periodically, they get to look down and see how the church is doing. There's Joanna. Go, girl, go. Because they're, they're rooting us on. They're all about us finishing our race. Are you with me? Not only that, but how many here have relatives that have gone on that are saved? They get the chance to look down once in a while, too. You can't talk to them direct, but you can say something like this, Lord, hey, let my dad know I love him. Let my mom know, hey, that she was the best. You can do those things because God relays those things from you to them. They can't come down and visit you. Let me blow something away. If you've got something that shows up at your bed and looks like grandpa, well, it isn't. It's a demon because that's called a familiar spirit and God won't let him out of heaven to come visit you. All right? It just doesn't work that way. Okay? Well, I saw it looked just like a well. We see a lot of things Satan wants us to see so he can pull us away from our relationship. Hello? Amen. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. First thing that Satan does to a Christian, or anyone for that matter, is to show you something else. Let me example. There's nothing to see here. Look over there. Nothing to see here. Look over there. So you're believing for your healing, right? And you believe God and everything like that. And immediately Satan says, look over there. You've not been a, a real faithful believer lately. That's probably why you're sick. And so he exchanges something else other than the promise of God. Then the second stage of that is you dwell on it and then you start to feel more pain. Now your eyes slip fully off of God and on how you feel. And piece by piece by piece, the enemy takes you down a little rabbit hole until you wake up and you go, ah, what am I doing? Keep memorializing God. He will give you the wisdom that's from above. Say amen. 
We need to be acting on the word, not acting out our feelings. <laughs> Let's move right ahead. Are you with me? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, the word cloud there in the Bible simply means a whole multitude of people. Okay? Okay, when you see the word cloud, most of the time, it means a group of something. A cloud of horses, a group of horses. It's just a phrase. It's an old English phrase, okay? So it says, look, I love what it says, okay? With a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. Who does it say to lay aside? You. You lay aside every weight. Let's stop right there. He's not talking about weight, weight. He's talking about the things, now listen carefully, that you maybe are doing, that somehow God has been saying, why are you doing that? It's like a wasted effort. Or maybe it's something you do and you don't even have joy in doing it anymore. I'm not talking about something for the Lord. I'm, we have sometimes involvements in our life, like somebody will take on a hobby and they'll buy all the stuff and they'll lose interest after about two months. And here's this big shed of hobby material that's become a weight. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm, I am not talking to you you just forget any, I, you know, it's weird. Let me say it, it's different about me. It's when the Holy Spirit starts talking like this, it usually has your mail. But I don't know you, you have that situation at all. I have no clue. But with my life, there are certain things I used to get involved in and then lost interest. And then that thing later became a weight, like my truck. I had a beautiful truck God gave me. And then when I got my prosthetic leg, I can't shift and know that my foot's not going to slip off the clutch and I'm going to bump into somebody ahead. So what happened, something very good at the time was perfectly what I needed and what God gave me has now become an extra weight. Hello? Because I can't drive it. So what do I do? I lay aside. So Lord, I, I ask you to sell my truck and provide something I can drive. See, that's what it means. And so don't put yourself under any guilt. You know, if you look about every human being, they've probably got two, three households of, of things stored in their closet and sheds. You know, and God says, get rid of it now. <laughs> no. So the weight that besets us is the very things that we have that slow us down in our relationship with God. Say amen. Whatever they be. Okay? And then the sin. Everyone say sin. People, you got to know this, so let me teach you. The word S-I-N, sin, singular, means the nature of sin that Adam got and passed on to you. Say the nature of sin. Okay, now listen. So the word sins with an S means the deeds of the nature of sin. Okay? So we sin because Adam gave us birth to a sinning nature. Hello? Because sin was in us before we got born again, we just sinned. So the scripture says in Romans 5, it says, we don't sin the way Adam sinned. We sin because of the natures in us. Mischief is born in the heart of a child, and it says a rod of correction will drive it out. Can you say amen? Old Testament there. But you think about it. So sin by the nature means the nature of sin, sin your flesh, what causes us to get old, wrinkled, have aches and pains, headaches, whatever. That's the sin nature in our flesh. You're not going to take that with you. You're going to shed it. But you do take that body, that flesh. We call it flesh. Scripture calls it flesh, carnal flesh. It says you take it in and lay it on the altar so it doesn't bother your doom the day. Who's following you around? Oh, that's my flesh, you know. <laughs> well, don't let it get too close. Can you say amen? Here, flesh. No. Just get, let's get on. Right. So sin, the nature of sin, or actually the nature of Satan, that's sin. And sins, the action of that nature in our life. Now, how many's ever heard this phrase? Don't ever use it again. 
I'm just a sinner saved by grace. What are you, a sinner? Or are you saved by grace? Sounds like you're double-minded there. Are you a sinner saved by grace? Are you saved by grace and you're not a sinner? So if you read 1 John a couple places in 3 and in a couple other places in 1 John, not the book of John, it says if God lives in you, you will stop practicing sin. So you're not a sinner. You might make a mistake. You might fall down once in a while, but who doesn't? But you don't go out and practice sin and declare you're a Christian. You know what I mean? So you were a sinner. Now that you got saved by grace, you're a child of God and you're learning how to walk with him. That's who you are. And your job is to keep him on your mind. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we with an open face, like looking in a mirror, we see the face of God. We are still being changed into that very image. So don't take your eyes off of, Je off of Jesus. Keep him memorialized. Can you say amen? So seeing that we're surrounded with such a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the nature that causes us to trip. The only way we can get rid of this nature that bothers us so much is to crucify it in God's presence on the altar first thing in the morning. Listen, I don't want to wait till it gives me problems and then prayer. I don't want half the day to be gone and all of a sudden I got this situation. If I would have sought God in the morning, I would have had all that dealt with and maybe that little situation wouldn't have got his ugly head up. Right? Let's be preventative in our Christianity and let's do it in faith. So how do we go about that? We begin to put on our mind all of those who were affected positively from God. And it says, now listen, and let us run the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who's taking care of you? Who's making your faith? Who's, who's causing you to be a champion? Amen. So don't take any credit. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the Father. So because of what Jesus did, and because we have so many clouds of witnesses, it doesn't do any good to become a complainer. Because when we have a lot of things weighing us down, what comes out of our mouth? Here's how the enemy works. He throws a suggestion to you. You have a right to either dwell on it or not. If you dwell on it, next thing you know, you start seeing things in your mind. Then he suggests it, then you start thinking about it. And as you think about it, then you start talking it. And as you talk it, then you start walking it. Just because the enemy lays an egg, don't let it be in your hair. Can you say amen? <laughs> don't dwell on things that don't glorify God or bless you. Why? You're too old now for any of that foolishness. <laughs> it's all foolishness. Moving right along. Are you with me? A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, we know who these witnesses are. How about mom and dad? Mom and dad save? They're looking down. Once in a while. Amen. I hope my God lets my dad look down while I'm quoting him. Son, do you know what I'm saying? Dad, everybody does. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. They go, okay, they get to look down from heaven and see us and encourage us. So let's go on to the next scripture. Hebrews 11, please. How do we approach God? By what? Faith. Faith. Never by works. So when we memorialize and remember and we show respect to, sometimes we're thinking about all the good things God did for us in the past. That's okay. And sometimes we can't wait and see all the good things he had planned in the future. 
because God's plans for you are good, not bad. Can you say amen? You're not living the horror scope. <laughs> Moving right along. All right, verse 1 says, Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the substance of things what? God says in you, your faith to God will bring substance to what you hope for. How many here hope for heaven? Faith will bring you there. Now, let me, I'll explain. Hope, say hope, hope, is like your thermostat in your house. When you're too warm, what do you do? You turn it down. You got the heat pump going and it's all so good. Okay? And then in wintertime, you dial up the heat to keep everything comfortable. And if you're you're like some people, they just put it in one setting and it keeps it the same way most of the time. Can you say amen? So your faith and your hope work together. So your hope, the things you expect, the things you look forward to, the things that you have a excitement about, that's the way you should come to church because you'll never leave disappointed. Even if the church is boring, you'll get something while you're expecting to. We don't get up in the morning expecting God to minister to us. We should because we're the ones without. He isn't. Amen. So what happens is your hope dials the temperature in your life. And your faith brings you there. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, title deed, of things not seen. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? If I see what the scripture says, by his stripes I'm healed, that's, I can put my hope into what God says. Can you say amen? And then as I thank him, my faith goes to work and brings the healing because my faith is no longer mine. It belongs to God who lives in me. So when my hope is dialed up, God who lives in me brings it to pass. Hello. So if your hope is fluctuating, one minute it's down, the next minute it's up, the next minute it's down, does God, can God answer that? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you get up, search the scripture. Let God dial up your hope. Are you there yet? Have you got everything God wants for you to have? No. Dial up your hope. Because the God who lives in you will bring you there. Now, here's the lie. Well, what if God doesn't really want that for you? You see the lie? And what if you're asking for too much and he doesn't really see the lie? God doesn't say any of that. He simply says, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. Ladies, you're included. <laughs> Sorry, me turning my back to you. I used to, years ago, used to pop up and run all around and everything like that, but I need to stay on the pulpit. You know, can you say amen? All right, so let's read some of these testimonies, and then let's think about our testimony, and let's, let's close for the day. Have you got several people that maybe you want to honor? If I hand you a mic that you want to thank God about? And if, if you haven't thought of anybody like that, you know, maybe I can start you off. But, uh, and if you're kind of shy about that, that's okay. I'll do it all for you. <laughs> no, I won't. All right, so let's look at this, okay? Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and by it, the people that's gone on before us obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the, that the worlds, actually the word worlds are as ages, that is each age a believer framed was framed by the word of God. So it reads like this, by faith we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which appear. So men's faith asked God to intervene and things like the nation of America was born. Men's faith prayed for their family 
women and men, and their whole family comes to know the Lord. God wants you to dial high. Can you say amen? He wants you to believe. Sky's the limit. He wants you not to restrict him in any part of your life. And you'll say, well, God, I'm going to need some help. Absolutely. So let's find out what some of these people did. How many remember some of the stories of these old patriarchs? So he lists them. In verse 13, drop down on chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not in fear, <laughs> having received, having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they are called to mind that country from which they have come out of Egypt, they would have had opportunity to return. But instead, now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be, be called their God. And it goes on down to verse 32, and I'm just going to read it real quickly and then open the floor up for you, okay? And what more can he say, he says, for the time would fall, now, would fall me to tell of Gideon. You remember Gideon? Gideon was a type and shadow of Christ, but also type and shadow of a believer who lives in you. What was Gideon supposed to do? Remember he had that little lantern? And the light was in the lantern, and the lantern was made out of clay. And at the right time, he was supposed to do what? Stri you guys need to read some of your Bible. <laughs> Strike the lantern, and, and it would break, and then the power of God would go. Well, who's the lantern in your heart? What is the clay vessel? Your flesh. Let God smash your flesh and let himself out. Can you say amen? So everything in the Old Testament is a memorial, a type and shadow of what Jesus either is doing or what Jesus did and what the believer has in their heart. Can you say amen? amen. So to tell you about Gideon and, and Barak and Samson and Jathan and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became vigilant in battle, turned the flight of armies of the aliens, aliens, just joking. Turn the armies of aliens. Back in, the, back in the day, you either were a citizen or you were an alien from that country, so don't worry about it. He's not referring to... Woo. Okay. All right. Just for Michael's sake, you know. Aliens. All right. Amen. It says, others were, bear, uh, were tortured, accepted. Uh, they would not accept deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had uh, trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. Isaiah was sawed in two. They were tempted. They were strained with the sword. They were uh, slain. They, were, um, they wandered in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted. You're going, my goodness, what did these people do this for? So that you and I could have salvation. They followed God. Now, best to help us, and then I'll give you the mic, and we'll open the floor if you want. Remember in the Old Testament, God was very limited. So the people that loved God, they had to faithfully make a covenant with God and stay in fellowship with God so God could work with them in this polluted earth. It was so bad, people were having sex with animals on the streets. 
The only reason, people don't understand, the reason why God made the Israelites and made them separated is so that the world wouldn't corrupt them. The way God said, you eat only the things I tell you to eat, why? Because venereal diseases were in the Molochs and in the animals, and they were to stay away from the ones that the, the worldly, wicked people, the pagan people worshipped. They worshipped animals, and in doing that, it would have sex with them, and then they would cook the animals. And so we think, hey, it's really bad now. Oh, gosh, you haven't seen anything. It's starting to get like the days of Noah. That's what God said. But you and I, our eyes are not supposed to be on the world. The world's passing away. So guess what? I pulled all my investments. I had a lot of money in the stock market. And I pulled it all out and reinvested in other things. God. Because... <laughs> One time I lost over $30,000 when the Microsoft balloon popped. That was great for my inheritance. Hello? God made it up, thank God. So we don't invest in the world as much as we can. Can you say amen? Because the world's passing away. We don't invest so much in other people. Our family's wonderful. Our friends are wonderful. We don't pour ourselves out. See, because if you pour yourself out to your family and they don't appreciate you by lifting you up and giving you honor, they're going to burn you out and think that, oh, well, mom, this slept early. <laughs> you got to put your foot down. Can you say amen? Are you with me? And so the interesting things about you and I is if we focus on God and remember and give honor to whom honor is due, that's what this day is about. Can I start you off? Dun, 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 dun. Does anybody here want to share about somebody? No hands? Good. No. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I am. I'm going to come back up. First of all, I have two that I want to lift up. And your average, you know, when you have two people that you lift up, of course, we could always include God, can't we? All right, but here's what I want to lift up. I had a sixth grade teacher. I don't know if he was truly born again. I think maybe he was. His name was Mr. Diamond. And I'm very, very thankful and very in remembrance of him because he made learning fun. He would read us books and he would engage with us and he somehow made the teaching and the, and the understanding of it a lot of fun because, you know, knowledge is a blessing. Can you say amen? And I noticed that through my time with Mr. Diamond that he would have all these visitors come from previous years and they would stop in almost every day, some two, three of them at a time, paying honor and respect, memorial, you see. There's nothing wrong with giving respect to whom respect is due. Amen. So there's one I can use just so you know it doesn't have to be family. I'm not sure if he's a Christian, but he made a tremendous impact in my life. Amen. And so I have to, I have to honor one more, my mom. Yes, Carrie, you were a mama's boy. That's what I was told, but I, I probably was. And I love my dad, too. They both have their purposes. But something that my mom would always do is she would take the time to, to listen to me and say, how you feeling, son? What's going on? Anything you want to share? And, of course, I was sometimes, nah, leave me alone, mom, you know. But I wanted to say thank God for my mother and because... She saw to it that I had a good education. She saw to it that her and dad were at everything that I did. See, there was only two of us, my sister and me. And God loved me best. Oh. <laughs> my parents were very supportive. So if we had a baseball game, they would be there. And if I was playing football, they would be there. 
there was that. So my mom was the instigator of it. Because my dad at that time was pretty busy doing all the dads do and all that kind of thing, but he always had time for me. But my mom, she was there, seemed like 24 seven and made an impression on my life. So there you go, there's an example of somebody you can say thank you to God for. Anybody else wanna say, say something? All right, shall I give BJ a mic? <laughs> she won't be on camera, all right, all right. No, yeah, it's all right. Being on camera is not all it's cracked up to be. Right up there, two inches. I have two also, and the first one is my mother. Is it on? Is the green light on the bottom of that thing? I don't see any light. That's my fault. I'll put it here. There we go. The first one is my mother. Uh, I come up, for those of you who don't know me, uh, very uh, much about me anyway. I come from a family of 13 people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm the oldest of the kids. I had seven brothers and three sisters. But I had a dad that was very abusive and a mother who was a lovely Christian lady. Thank you, Lord. And uh, she always tried to protect us, me in particular. And uh, she was always she was always praying for us kids, and some of this I didn't find out uh, until my brother been talking about our parents. And uh, I went to I didn't realize that she had set up with my friend's mother to come and stay with them so that I could get away from my dad, and uh, so. I, I really appreciate all she did for us. She wasn't a person that let you know. She she was there for you, and she was a strong lady in a quiet way. And uh, one of the things I found out afterward, after she died uh, from a coworker was that she was working out at American Lake, and she had cancer at the time. And the bosses figured that if uh, she was well enough to work, that uh, the people there didn't need to help her do anything. If she dropped a pencil or something, they weren't even to pick something like that up. So what, if you could take it all in a matter of 30 seconds, okay. what do you think, God, about your mom? I think mom. Otherwise, we'll be here all afternoon. <laughs> No. <laughs> she's she writes, you know, she's been writing a book right there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, what I think my mother was a strong, very strong woman, and an example of uh, for us of who God was and how much He loved awesome. us. Awesome. Awesome. Hey. I want to. You got one more. Okay. All right. That's a quick one, though. I'll She's going to talk about all the missionaries down in Africa. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I assume the Why missionary. Not? I had one person. Yeah, I'm all forgetting. Uh, yeah. There was a woman who was in our church, a little Baptist church down in Springfield, Oregon. And uh, she was a lovely, lovely lady. And she's one of those people that, uh, she just seemed like the light of, of God was always around her, and she was not a person who uh, was, it was quiet. She was, she was strength, but she was quiet. And I always wanted to be like her, both Amen. her and my mother. And I hoped I've attained some of that. I'm not quiet, though. <laughs> I was going to say, did you have any friends come around you and say, hey, take a hint? <laughs> uh, I can't remember her name. No. Anybody else real quickly? Again. Okay. Mom. You got a couple of people back here. Who is it? Oh. <coughs> Are you guys hands up? The restroom is back there. <laughs> I know I am. That's why I'm saying it. All right. Okay, what do you want to thank God? Two really quick. Girl, you go first. Do you thank God for? I thank God for 
my mom. And what has she done for your life? She's been there to support me throughout a whole lot of stuff. And you, and you know she's the best mom. Yeah, that's for oh, sure. Hey, man, tell her that right there. You're the best mom. Did you have a second? I do. It's my dad. All right. Turn around to him. And what about your dad? What do you think, God? He's there for me whenever I need a bride. <laughs> Mr. Taxi. That's never good. It's, it's going to be a new series. And what do you thank God for? I want to thank God for my lovely husband that has been there for me the past two years. He's changed ago. your life. Yes, with my health scare that I had the past year, he supported me and has been there through the whole health scare that I had. He supported me. Amen. He through me. He did not leave. He stayed there. He supported me. I can see his initials in your forehead. <laughs> Aren't you glad for husbands? Yes, yes Who yes. else? And then, no, oh, mom, of course. It, there's, there's a foster parent, there's a foster family that I grew up with. They're dead now, but they're Christians. And they, they were there, and they were throughout my whole life. And they were there. Do you have a last name? Corey's. All right, the Corey's. So yeah. you're going to lift them up in prayer, uh, the family that's re remaining, yeah. right? Yeah. And we thank God for them, right? Anybody else? <laughs> it's on it is um, I want to thank God for my mom she's been a very good example yes Proverbs 31 woman <laughs> two inches two inches is that better that's yeah, much better so I want to thank her for who she is and all she does and all life lessons she's taught and continues to Amen. share. And my brother, for being a great brother, and for my church, and everybody in here. Isn't God good? All the time. And, and of course, everybody forgot that these are people that have gone on and no longer alive. <laughs> I'm joking with someday. you. <laughs> yeah, someday. Okay. <laughs> We're all gonna go home pretty soon, so it's, it's all good. You weren't going to do it. Well, I just thought of somebody. There you go. <laughs> I want to thank a certain pastor. I've had a lot of pastors in my life, but only one stands out that I've really learned from, and that's our pastor, Carrie. And I really appreciate him, and I just thank the Lord that he is an open vessel for the Lord to speak through him all the time. And as I said, I've had other pastors but they have never opened themselves up like Carrie has. And I really appreciate it. We are very blessed to have him as a pastor. I know Thank I'm you, Jesus. I'm honored you would say that. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's just like with all the pot shots I've had, I mean, something has missing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, it's not really being a pastor. I think what happens is, and we're going to finish now, but... I think what happens to people when they think they're going to go in a position or God has a position for them, we think too much about the position and not enough about how God is orchestrating everything. And just remember in your life to always keep your focus on who? God. Jesus or God, right? And keeping all the other focuses. Now, I asked the Lord, I said, why did you give me something to tell everybody about? Keeping eyes off the world, off off of the others, off of themselves. He says, if you work with me with it, I'm real loud. So that's because I have two mics on. Anyway, if you, you'll work with me, he, he, you know, he just he kind of distract me. I almost lost my thought. He works with us and he develops our hearts. But when we, we have to let him be what we're focusing on. Because his wisdom, he'll just saturate with a wisdom that you don't know where it's coming from. Well, it's rising up within God inside of you. And he meets every need. So eyes have to be off the world because it has no energy to sustain you. It only teases us. Eyes off of others because even though the most well-meaning people, we all have flaws. And to have eyes on somebody, and if somebody, if you put your eyes on a human being too much, 
they can get a big head and they can start manipulating you. So listen, I don't want your eyes on me, even though your eyes are not. The reason being is I'm not your leader, Jesus is, you know, and that's the most important thing. And then eyes off yourself, this is the killer. Satan works hard to give human beings an alternative. The alternative is that you don't need God, you got yourself, you got your friends, you got your money, you got your job, you got your wife. He always tries to give us an alternative, but we know that everything goes better with Jesus. Can you say amen? Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Lord, we memorialize all those who've gone on before us, soldiers and ministers, those who have fought in the wars, those that have gone across and made peace, even in areas that we don't even know that they're fighting, taking care of things before they get out of hand. Lord, we bless them and we memorialize the fact that you died and you rose again and you live in our hearts today. Help us to love others as you love us. In Jesus' name, everyone said.